Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Rob Bundick. I'm the director for healthcare technology management and biomedical engineering at Health Healthcare. We're a community-based uh, not-for-profit organization uh, serving Walker, mainly Walkershaw County uh, in a few areas. A little bit about Pro Healthcare: uh, three hospitals, roughly 360 beds, um, 13 clinics. Some are popping up now with COVID testing, and so that number's fluctuating for us. We're shutting some down, opening some up at the moment. Um, we do have a freestanding emergency room in Milano, uh, Wisconsin, that was being built as a hospital, but because of COVID, has been paused. So that's that will soon be uh, our fourth hospital, hopefully within the next year. Um, we do have a regional cancer center for any of you that came from the west and drove 94 headed east. Uh, you may have seen it on the edge of the interstate, um, right, right there in Waukesha. So F, I believe. Is it F? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we part. We have some uh, partnerships uh, with uh, surgery centers, endoscopy centers, uh, and, and different uh, physicians offices. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we have an HTM department and a biomedical engineering department. So it was, uh, it's split for us for a couple of reasons. One is, is to capture our cost. Uh, we want to keep cost of service away from cost of ownership. So anything in biomedical engineering is actually pure service. We can track our service for equipment. Anything HTM related is, is related to owning that device. So our biomedical engineering department is made up of a supervisor. We have one admin slash dispatching person, um, seven senior biomed techs, two imaging, five senior imaging, and one imaging associate. I get questioned a lot about what an imaging associate is. Uh, that imaging associate is uh, the bridge between biomed and imaging for us. Uh, we've developed a program where we actually grow our engineers in-house. So we actually love hiring entry-level engineers and, and building them up. So that imaging associate position is the bridge between a biomed senior and an imaging technician. Our HTM department uh, consists of my, myself as the director of both departments. Dave was our cybersecurity analyst. We do have a, a, a database analyst who runs our CMMS system. Uh, we have roughly about 18,000 devices. Dave will get into that. But her job is solely managing that equipment, managing our workflow processes, reports, uh, reconciling financials, any of the data analytics that is our department, she's, she's the one doing it. Um, medical device integration engineer, we work closely with our IT department. Uh, we actually have an integration engineer that was a biomed technician that we converted to that position. His job solely is to focus with, with IT and building that device integration uh, workflow so that our engineers can actually focus on service and equipment. Uh, life cycle planner, right? Yes. Uh, we sell and dispose and move our assets ourselves. So in our organization, um, we hopefully rarely ever trade in equipment. We have found that we can make a lot more money selling that equipment on the um, open market than by actually trading it into the OEM. Parts procurement specialist. For those of you engineers that order your parts, come see me, we'll talk about this. Our engineers don't order parts. If they need parts, they go to our part procurement specialist. Part procurement specialist sources that part, orders it, updates the work orders, lets the engineers know what's going on. They also send out equipment for depot service, any core exchanges they handle those process. Uh, and then the last position that was recently added about a year ago, it's a project manager position for us. It also does all of our capital planning. So any of our fleet planning for medical devices, any of our imaging equipment, we actually have to build five-year replacement plans. At Pro Healthcare, we know what we need to buy over the next five years when it comes to medical devices and how much money we need to spend. Came in very handy this year with COVID hitting us, and we had you know money being lost, and we had to reevaluate what our capital expenditure was going to be. Knowing what we had to spend over the next five years it allowed us to make good good decisions about what to push off, what to shift, what to move. Yeah. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. We'll go through how we actually set up our cybersecurity program and then uh, hopefully give some examples. Do you have any questions? We'll sure, we have any questions. Thanks for coming. Uh, I don't know if any of you listened to our presentation and the expo was uh, in July, I think it was. Um, so it was one of when they started to do the virtual ones. So we, we did the same, same presentation there that we're gonna do today. But um, welcome again. 
Thank you for coming. This has been a good crowd. So, um, as Rob was talking, you know, God, I've been in this now three years now into this position. Um, he was thinking in house that we needed to kind of get a cybersecurity. He'd been trying for multiple years to try to get a cybersecurity in, in the biometric sector because, as we all know, there's a strong stronghold on the IT side that they're already doing their their security work and their management of, of all their devices on the IT side. But when you get into medical devices, that's a little bit bigger of a black hole. Nobody knows really what's on the network and how it's how it's working and how it's done doing things. So so Rob uh, uh, finally got an approval to get a position open. I actually was an IT side. Uh, I was a tax administrator prior to this position. Um, so I, I had a, a real good understanding of what the IT, our internal IT department did and how they did it and who they were. So um, unfortunately for Rob and for me, um, you know, I just moved over across the hall and then became a biomed security uh, analyst. So what we did first off and what they had already been doing is beginning a, uh, you know, our CMS, the first thing you do most experts will say is if you don't know what's on your network, you can't control it. If you don't know what you have, then you don't know what you have. So um, even before I got into this position, they had started on the CMMS. Everybody, hopefully everybody got the CMMS in their place. Hopefully they're not going to roll the next party as we were talking about earlier at breakfast. Um, and, and so obviously we use uh, connectors as ours. And so I'll get into some more details on what we're how we're expanding that CMMS and what we're doing specifically internally to help us help our, 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 our organization. So first off, again, the first thing most agree on is you want to create a successful, uh, you need an active medical device in the And so how, how can it be uh, created? What do you need to get in there? Um, you know, it's, it's all dependent on what your organization thinks. Obviously, it'd be, be Easy stuff is, you know, what's what it is, who's the manufacturer, all the details up there. But um, when we started to look at that, we wanted to specifically detail network attributes to the medical devices that we have, or all the devices that we have. And that's a big key when you get into cybersecurity, of course. You want to know what's on your network, you want to know how it happens, what you need to know, how it appears on your network. So I don't know, you know, that the Expertise level on the network side here in this room. Um, so a lot of us talk, you know, just simple to all just make it even for everybody. Um, all right, so this is our informatics page that we created specifically for medical devices in our CMS. We've done a lot of changes to this. This is actually a very open picture. Um, we were in the process of making some additional changes to that. Um, we're, we're just want to uh, point out a few things that are, are pretty key to these things. So we've got MAC addresses that are hidden down here. So obviously that's what touches your network. When you put a device in the network, the first thing it talks to the network switches is by MAC address. So that's a, the first thing to be talking to the network. So that's why we want to gather what that is. We go here, we get uh, software stuff, you know, operating system, operating version. Now with Windows 10, we've got all these different versions coming on. There's different builds, 1607, 1803, 1903, now we're in the 2000s. All of those have different expiration dates. So we thought when we got the Windows 10, we're good, that we didn't have to patch anymore. Everything should be one, well, now each different level of build is a different thing. So we want to capture what build we have and what, actually I put in here, what's the expiration date. So when is Microsoft going to stop uh, you know, supporting that particular product with the normal patching? Obviously, it's all Windows-based. You know, when you get into the Linuxes and the RTOSs and stuff, we can capture that. It's you know, a whole different process. Um, like the thing, we kind of, kind of capture as much licensing as we can here. So I you know, we always feel that as much detail as you can capture that, that's usable for the engineer. And a front-facing application is obviously patch protected, so 
you couldn't come into our organization to get into this. There's a rules around that. As much detail as we can give folks to be able to do their job the first time, that's what we're going to try to do. So it's, it's a multi faceted approach to this. It helps me when I'm trying to pull reports and figure out what's going to involve the building. It helps the engineers if they need to know a password or whatever, because we have that down here in the lower, the lower part. Um, it helps. You know, the organization when they when they need to know how many people send the devices we got, we can pull reports against all of them. So this is a, this is a, a big expansive page that keeps growing. We keep finding out other things we want to add in there. Ultimately, when we get a, a, a good, I want to say it's a good F bomb, a good software building materials from the vendors, we'll probably add some of that too in here. Because as you probably are aware, vulnerabilities are putting out against SQL. Against Adobe, against other app, uh, other software applications that may be put into your devices that are not originally there. <laughs> so the one thing we just have to implement next week uh, internally is when our engineers get a new piece of equipment that they want to put into our system or, or into our organization in an onboarding process, the work order that they create now has some. Mandatory if some things, uh, some things apply. So, uh, in a better better example of this, this one here is networks. So, if this is network now. The engineers have to give me a MAC address, have to give me uh, an IP address if it's static or DHCP. They can put DHCP. Have to give some some software versions, some OS versions. We want to get this filled in initially from the from the onset because. Going back, as you got up there, you got to fill all this information. This was very tedious, very time consuming. So, if you got the device before it's in production, you can get all the information now. I think that's the best time to do it. And, and then it's in there. And then, um, you know, the device integration specialist and myself, we go through it. We got to look through it, make sure it's all good, check it out. So, if it's not networks, we still want OS versions. We still want MAC addresses because it's not network doesn't necessarily mean it can't be networked. It's just in this scenario, it's not that. So I'll get into an application that we, we also use and explain to you why knowing the MAC addresses is very key. And if it's not capable of being, being networked, then all those mandatories go away. If it's not capable, it doesn't have it there, it doesn't have it. So we just kind of move on to your life. Question. Yes. Are you forcing any of those fields to be filled out prior to accepting the inventory of that part? Yes. Yeah, and that was uh, that was kind of that time learned that. So yes, specifically now, as I can go into effect next week when that uh, new machine is, if you got a new piece of equipment that's that you're bringing to the system and engineers got a order order that they can call out all the manufacturer all the other details. If it, if you say it's network. Then you have to do these other things. And if they're not filled in correctly, then the database have, uh, the database administrator will take back to you and say, hey, this isn't filled in correctly. Or in and, and you've always said, you know, hey, you got issues, you know, call me, you know, I'm working from home now. Call me and, and I'll, I'll help you get through that stuff and figure out how to finance. Because sometimes sometimes it's as we all know, you know, these devices are sometimes embedded, sometimes they don't get to. I mean, there's an MDF in form that we try to get from the vendor that's supposed to have a lot of detail in it too, but they're sometimes as old as the, the you know, the furthest away revision that they put out. So it could be even two or three years old. Any other questions? So once we get a bit of the MMS, we get, we're pretty comfortable with where we are with that. Um, you know, that again, that's your, that's your baseline. So now what you do, what we're doing is we reached out and just as I was kind of getting into this position, Rob had already started investigating uh, applications out there that can um, passively put on your network and kind of look at all your network traffic flow and figure out what's, what's going on. So the first summer I was here, we started looking at uh, a few of these and again, if we do, they sit on your network they watch the traffic flow, they, they grab off bits and pieces of the, the network traffic. 
and ident it identifies the MAC address, the device, what it is, um, what it, what it, who it's talking to, and it, and it puts it all into like basically a dashboard. Um, we did a, a proof of concept with a few of these. We, we narrowed it down to one. But here's just a list of the four that we looked at originally to now 2020. This is this is three years old. Uh, 2020 now there's at least a dozen out there for the four. So if you're looking at doing something like that and want to get started, you know, feel free to get, get to me or talk to me or Rob. Um, we can kind of get you through a, a thought process on how to initiate that. But I think it's a it's a it's a minor investment from your organization. Um, but it's you know we're starting to roll it out to the IT side where they're going to get some benefit from it as well. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So again, we have the concept. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Not, no, you're fine. Not, not to try to take it down the rabbit hole. What was some of the uh, main pressure that you put on your systems? Um, effectiveness. So when we did our proof of concept, and that's that's a good segue. When we did our proof of concept, we actually did them side by side. So we did. We had companies come in, put their restaurants in our network at the same time, and so we gave them the same bits of information. So you know, in this instance, we gave it. I think four or five different VLANs. So something that's a, a, a track. And we want to see how both of them are doing. So we're looking for how well they identify the product. So we want to make sure that the, the GDCP scanner didn't show up as a ultrasound machine. And there's signatures in, in the network traffic that identify what it is and how it goes. Um, so that's a very, um, they're getting better at even identifying even two years ago that this is basically a ground source or a cloud source apparatus. So we have our organization that we have our unique instance with. It feeds out to the cloud. And if we have a unique device in our environment that nobody else has, they put it up to the cloud, they disperse it sideways now. If another organization has a same location out in California and they see that same signature. Then they know how to identify it. So, right. so that that kind of thing is that. No, it, that, 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 that's my slide. Okay. okay. All right. Um, yeah. So we selected the vendor. So the way that these applications work, just so you're aware, um, and they'll tell you a lot more when they if you do a POC with them. They um, they attach to your network via either a tap or a span port. A span port actually. Directly connects to your core switches. Um, a tap actually, um, you parallel traffic from your core switches to a different port and it goes to, to the apparatus out. So it's a, a couple of different ways to do it. When we did the proof of concept, we did span ports we, with a limited number of VLANs, like I said earlier, and it, was, it worked out well. When we started going to the production with, with multiple, much, much more VLANs, uh, the spanning kind of caused some issues on our switches, and they were talking back and forth to each other and using a lot of CPU to switch this work. And so we ended up having a board tap process and then go to a tapping process. So just to be, you know, just one thing to be aware of um, depends on, you know, how good your switches are, how new your switches are, how good your, your switch engineers are. There's a whole lot of variable in there, but just be concerned about that or be at least conscious of that. Yeah, so that's what I was just talking about. CPU concerns. Um, so the network team shut down the, the spanning process. We went to a tap process. So north, west, uh, north, south, east, west traffic. Just want to explain this to you real quick. Sounds pretty simple. North, south traffic goes between buildings and goes between data centers. East, west traffic stays within the building. So if the high head traffic going from this room to the room over up, uh, on the fourth floor, that would be considered east-west traffic to, to us. If it was from here to the five Street Forum, that would be north-south traffic. It's going outside. It's going a uh, different, different process. The reason I mention that, based on how you're getting your, you're gathering your information, you need to be aware of that. Um, a lot of the east-west traffic may not be seen in the, in a tax situation because where we are tapping in our individual experiment, we're tapping at our data, our main data center. 
So we're waiting for everything to come through to our main data center to the servers there, and we're capturing all that data that way. If we're talking from floor to floor in a, in a hospital or a clinic, we're not seeing that now. So what we can do is put a span that would capture that in that smaller segment and capture it that way. So it's a, a, just a lot of variability that I won't get too much to the weeds because they already did. So, but I didn't want to use to understand north, south versus east, west. There's a big difference in the, in the way that network traffic flows. And, you know, you may already know that. Okay. So we've worked with, one of the reasons that we picked the, the company that we worked with, and Rob was a part of that, that uh, process, um, our IT folks were part of that process. We were feeding back to both companies, uh, off we come to, well, basically two companies that we were working with heavily during the pro uh, proof of concept process. And we were identifying um, what we thought would, should be better. One of the biggest things that we didn't talk about, and now it's actually in here as much, is utilization. These, these products now can, can figure out utilization. I'll go just briefly on that, but they can figure out utilization on how much you're using your equipment. It, it feeds well into the procurement process, the capital purchase process. If, you know, just as an example, we always use a, a big iron. If you got an MRI screen over here at the clinic, they said you need to replace, and it's only been used 40% of the time, then you kind of wonder why you really need to replace it. You know, there could be some other criteria to that, but so we go back and we look at some utilization data. We go back to management and say, hey, maybe we can rearrange schedules. Maybe we can push some more patients over to that one. Maybe we can do some other things to try to fix that. Yes. Did that, did that help the product pay for itself by doing that? By, you know, you decreased operations and your decreased capital spend. So we can try to quantify that. So, so from a justification standpoint, we did not focus on that. Um, we were focusing purely on the cybersecurity aspect. Um, when when I was tasked um, that year to, to look at cybersecurity, I was also tasked to come up with our uh, five-year forecasting plan that I had talked about. So I had two tasks that year to say, drive our capital equipment plan and help us save money on the capital equipment side. Also, you need to develop a cybersecurity program. So as I started looking at this before from day one, and I started seeing that the cybersecurity software can actually also give us utilization data, and that's when we started marrying the two together. But for this aspect, I didn't use that as justification for cybersecurity. I had already had that narrative to say, you need to go do this. No matter what the cost is, you need to implement a program. Where we did use utilize this, <coughs> excuse me, was our, our capital forecasting and capital planning side. So, the following year, which was last year, when we justified that, we actually looked at a 5% reduction of capital um, as part of uh, implementing the five-year plan, <laughs> using utilization data, using, using the model to be able to shift and push out when you can uh, extend capital. <clears throat> so for us, for all care rough, has roughly, well, not this year, but typically we spend between you know, 15 and $20 million and, and capital equipment on medical devices. So a 5% reduction of that is a huge is a huge savings for the organization, but it's not technically a savings because we're just extending that capital. I may not spend that 2.5 million this year, but I'm going to spend it next year. So it's, it's, it wasn't necessarily a savings, it was more of an extension of your capital. Sure. Can you touch on how it, when you say utilization, how do you know? Sure. So it's a, a good question. So learning that I think the best way to uh, identify it is if it's an imaging machine sending die contact data, you can track the die contact. So you can you can look at the die contact and see when the first image was taken, the last image was taken, and consider that being in use. It's not 100 percent accurate because you know it's crop time terrorizing. But that's the best way we can get to that aspect. Um, in other in other avenues, uh, IV pumps, if they're in use, they, they they show that they're pumping, and so you can kind of look at, at that on the network and kind of identify as that. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of watching the network traffic and seeing actually what's going on. That's the most difficult part for these companies that they're trying to ask to pay accurate 
utilization accurate data that the net as well, just because they're more of a, most of these companies that we're dealing with, but not all, came from the IT cybersecurity side. And they're, they're moving into the medical device world. And so it's a big learning curve for them. And, and that's why at Certifica, we're helping them help us. And, and, and in the software, you can actually set business hours for that device. So you're not, you can run it on, if it's a CT that supports an EV and it's 24 hours a day, your utilization is just on a 24 hour run. But if it's a CT at a clinic that's only Monday, Friday, to five, you base your utilization on that Monday, Friday, to five. So when you're looking at percentage number, it's a utilization percentage based on the, the business use of that. Now here, here, here's the, the tricky part, right? I could have two devices that are 90% utilization. One is a 24 hour window that's 90% utilization. One's 90% utilization on Monday, Friday, five. One machine is getting work three times as hard as one, right? So, so it helps get you data, but you really have to have some more insight into how you're doing it. So then we go back into the number of studies, the number of scans, things of that nature, and what's the priority of those devices in the organization. So there's where we, we take some of this information. Our, our project manager and capital planning tool then start taking that and say, here's where you should start scoring what we should replace. If they're both, if, well, say, say that the ER one is at 80% and the clinic one is at 90, I'm still going to give priority to the one supporting the ED, even though it's a lower utilization number. So all that is factored in. We just, this is just providing us some additional information to actually help us gain data to make proper decisions. Anything else? All right, so we kind of talking about we're feeding back back and forth with, the with our particular company that we chose, um, and I'm assuming all other hospitals are using different ones. We're doing the same process. So we're feeding back to them what we want to see, how they, how best they can do it. Um, there's a, a a lot of different integrations that they can do with existing IT applications um, with your your logarithms, your sims, your your uh, your Switch, you know, ice profile, your ice prime, your ice um, integration is there. We are doing some of the integration, we're doing not all of them, just for the simple reason that we want to keep control. I guess that's what I said. We don't want them to go ahead and, and make changes on our switches just because of what they think they saw. But what we do want them to identify is identify it to us, we can investigate it. And then we can make the appropriate actions. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about segmentation in a little bit, how we're using, using that. And so the other thing is the ability to, to baseline our network flows kind of gets into the segmentation segment. Um, but it talks about if you know your normal traffic for what this particular device is supposed to do, you can baseline that in the application, and all of a sudden it goes outside that. So basically. Okay, um, so the more enhancements that we're looking to do, uh, API to our CMS, for the simple reason that the, the source of truth is going to be this application for networking information because it's actually seeing what the device is saying in the network, whereas the source of truth uh, at the CMMS is going to be for some other manufacturing data, maybe some warranty expiration data, you know, so. So we've got, we're trying to get a bi uh, bidirectional API with that. This is just a fancy term. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. And we're still trying to play with that and we're gonna get there at some point. Um, again, the ability to target a device to install third-party applications. That's, we're working with the company trying to figure that out. Um, if it's a if your device is a domain device that's sitting on you know, the for whatever reason, if you've got an ultrasound machine that's Windows and it's sitting on your domain, well then it's got domain uh, domain attributes that a domain in, inquiry to that machine can get you some some feed out of all the applications or all the third party applications that are residing on an ultrasound machine. If it is not on the domain, we're finding now 
then it's a little bit more difficult to get that information. So there's a process out there as with RM, but you have to have an admin account sitting on the device. And most medical manufacturers aren't going to allow me to put a, another user account on their device. So we're still working through that process. We're trying to figure it out. But that's going to be huge when we get that, because again, what I talked about earlier, if you've got an Apache vulnerability, who knows what's what what who knows how many of your devices are running Apache? Anybody? Something? Yeah, nobody. So that's the that's the most difficult part. You know, you, you don't usually maybe an Apache is a bad one, maybe SQL is a good one. You know, a lot of them have these many these internal databases that they're running. So what version are they running? Is it 2006, 2007 that's outdated? Or you're Running a good one that's 2014, 2017. That's still in still in production. So that information ideally would be good to find out and, and, and document something. And that's what we're looking for to get get to. So micro segmentation or just segmentation? Um, I'm gonna go forward. I'm come back. So this is a, a segmentation. What how it looks. Like. Not sure uh, how much are familiar with segmentation. So, in the in the original uh, network, you probably you know you just got everything that's sitting on your network. It's just all over the place. And so, what you want to try to do is you want to segment them for different reasons. A lot of organizations do it with VLANs, subnets. They, they just kind of say everything's uh, in a, a, a maybe all of Philips machines are in one particular subnet, but that's a form of segmentation. So the reason you do that is if a vulnerability or attack happens on a Phillips machine inside your network, you can shut down the whole VLAN and now you kind of save the rest of your network for that particular, that particular instance. Um, for our, in our world, what we're doing now, based on devices and how we're going to segment them, we're doing it based on uh, manufacturer and model. So we're assuming that all GE ultrasounds are going to act the same way. And that's uh, maybe a true, true, uh, true or not true, depending on what department is. We're assuming that all CVs and MRs are going to act the same way. And that's probably a little bit simpler because they're all MRs. They're all in one department. So what we do then in the application is we watch the normal traffic. We identify what's, what's the normal traffic flow based on what we think it's supposed to do internally or externally. Um, the one thing that we're, we're finding trouble with, and I'll talk about in a bit, is the phone home capabilities, how they're doing that. So we find out uh, the application can find out this, this traffic flow. It actually can create an ACL. Um, and which is an access control list. This ACL is basically what I just talked about, who it's talking to and how it's talking to it, what port it's talking to. And the ACL is then just an export out of this application. Um, we clean it up a little bit, and then we can apply that in our, in our Cisco ICE uh, application, which actually controls all the network traffic. So then what happens? So I put an access control list against a GE ultrasound machine, radiology GE ultrasound machine. The next time that that ultrasound machine authenticates to the network, it gets put in this profile, this ACL profile. What that does is that based on what that profile says, it can only talk to certain IP addresses out or only external IP addresses that are, that are allowed in this list to talk to the ultrasound machine. So we can see immediately how much neater our network is going to be just based off that. Does that make sense? Did lose anybody? Good. So, what the task was before everybody got sent home was to micro segment or segment everything in our at all medical devices by the end of our fiscal year, which ended Wednesday. It didn't happen. So, we're still it's a work in progress. We, we're trying to muddle through, trying to get all these devices into the segmentation process, and hopefully, then we can keep it all much more secure. So segmentation actually is one of our biggest goals with this application to allow us to see uh, what normal traffic flow is. 
The other advantages that I don't think I actually have on the slide is the application has um, connections with all the, the, the vulnerability um, exporters, if you will, uh, NIST and CBE. And so they get these vulnerabilities coming in from the national, uh, from our federal government. They put it in there and then they can do a, an immediate scan based on the attributes of them and see what devices are, uh, could be affected by the vulnerability. So I can export the list to me, I can start picking down the list and see, what, see what's going on. Now, any of you that works with medical device manufacturers, trying to get information out of them for patching or for uh, vulnerabilities or anything, you can see the I bang your head against the wall, get a lot of information. We're working through that as well. Set a call this week with Phillips, and hopefully um, they're going to have to change their process, GDs have to change that process. That's the biggest concern I always get when I go to these conferences and then I talk with other folks like me in, in, in my position, talking with vendors and the manufacturers. And, you know, that's always the, the hard knock that we get to the vendors say, hey, we need this data, we need more time, and we can't wait till you decide that, that this patch is going to be good for your equipment. So, and the FDA is backing us up on that. They're telling uh, the vendors that the manufacturers that just because it gets a patch doesn't mean you have to re-validate everything that it does. If it doesn't change the, the normal process of what your machine is supposed to do, then move forward with it. So that's always the biggest struggle. We find, yeah, we've got, and I'm still, I still have, I still have all of the work orders that are trying to be in my CMMS or Wi-Fi from 2017 because the vendors can't tell me that their equipment is not Affected by it, not, you know, there is no cash for it or whatever it is. So, yeah, just, it's, it's the biggest challenge for me. That's what keeps me, that's why I lost all my hair. It's <laughs> <laughs> hard time. All right, so if we do do an ACL on a particular product group, we put that in here in our informatics pages, ever growing informatics page. IT profile, if it's IT segmented, and the IT profile may, again, Reason is, is that one of our engineers is saying all of a sudden all of my GD ultrasounds are having networking issues. Then we could probably look at this, might be the, the focal point that's the cause of the issue. If uh, IT decides that the PAX servers are going to change their IP addresses and nobody tells me or us, you know, we probably wouldn't know that because we probably change it on the ultrasound machine because it's a destination. But let's just say it's slipped through. Obviously, none of these are going to be able to talk to that new IP address because it's not the ACL, they're not in the profile. So all that communication is going to be shut down. So just a couple of simple examples of why it's nice to have that ACL name embedded in some place that people can see other than just so yeah, back to this. All right. Um more questions, please. All right, so future enhancements again, we talked about uh, getting an API. Um, we talked about defining an OS upgrade path for procurement. So that's kind of the things we're working with, uh, with you know, uh, our purchaser. Or, um, we're trying to instill in our procurement process the understanding that the device is going to last for a million years. Or at least a particular Windows app, Windows version that you're selling. Uh, so, first thing that you, you should do in your procurement process is, is push back on, the, on your manufacturer. If there's any manufacturer that pops up, push back on them and say, hey, what are you going to do with my equipment when Windows 10 goes to Windows 11? Just as an example. Or when, if it's iOS and it changes version, you've got an updated version. So that's one of the key that we're trying to instill in our internal process. Make sure that if you understand, that if we understand that it's going to last more than a month. I mean, we've got that that we prepared. We still got to see that capture out there running in Windows NT for one be five years now. Oh, another. Yeah, <laughs> but it still works. 
Now, if the person that managed that was in this room, you'd have a, a different opinion on that. Yeah. So for that path, are you looking at tracking that? There's like a three-step field and you're seeing that yeah. or offline. Yeah, again, we'll go back to the <clears throat> here you go. So yeah, that stuff is right here. It's hard to see from that angle. Yeah. Yeah. It says uh, OS uh, operating system. It's got operating system, operating version, and it's actually some uh, OS upgrade comments. And that is three steps. Okay. So I have right in there what the uh, top the Microsoft what website and what their expiration and when they're going to stop support. So when we do our capital planning and, and our project manager, she she can pull the inventory report from our CMS. This this information is actually able to pull down when we when we do those reports. So we every year when we refresh that, every six months when we refresh that, we can pull that data and we can say, all right, we know this is this is coming to the end of life. Let's go ahead and move that up the list. The the other piece that we're we're actually exploring now is we talk about we're we're buying equipment that's Windows 10 brand new. I don't plan on getting rid of the CT for you know 10 plus years. Windows 10 is probably not going to be here in 10 years. So when I'm sitting down with that manufacturer and I'm talking about what's our plan, I, I'm leveraging that now for me. Right now, we're having to buy upgrades. I don't ever want to buy an upgrade kit. Right? I, I'm working with you. I'm negotiating that with you. You want me to continue to buy your CTs? Guess what? We're going to include the lifetime of the operating platform as, as part of these purchases. So again, it, it, it extends your capital dollars. You don't have to worry about now reinvesting capital dollars in something you already bought. Good. Uh, so, yeah, secure a strategy has uh, tactical strategy. I talked about that earlier. It's, it's the biggest headache I have. Just keeping our equipment. Now, IT is pretty simple, right? You know. We got well, I never gave the numbers. Uh, so I think this device found 36,000 devices on our network. We were in a relatively small organization. Uh, out of those 36, 37,000 items, uh, 18,000 of those were IoT. So that means the other 10,000 were for managed devices, workstations, servers, whatever. And then out of the 18,000 are IoT, about 10% of that is actually not. So you got cameras out there, but I can print them. Um, point of cell devices in the cafeteria. <laughs> yeah, get point of cell, absolutely. Um, card readers in our, you know, going into our, they're all electronic. So, um, so based on uh, security, a uh, uh, fashion strategy, so where so it's IT, if they got a, a vulnerability for a Windows 10, you know, PC or, or Windows 10 application, they can push that, that KB out. You know, with one one click of a button, and all the workstations or all the servers are all their own cash. We just can't do that. So, you know. Yeah, it's, so um, when you're talking about network traffic and some of the device profiles, does your uh, does your CMS or some of the partner applications that kind of monitor the performance of network traffic? If you're identifying that, or are you still looking at the that's the application that we we install install that actually does that. There are some IT applications that do that as well. Um, I'm not privy to all of them that they would seem to work in for. But the application that we use that we that that base this whole presentation on is is doing all that. They're they're watching all traffic that's going on. Again, yeah, all from uh sorry. So no, I apologize. No, it's super obvious. Yeah. From the organizational process, do so the, the works go to your IT department and go straight to engineer? How does that how does that communication work? The abnormals? Yeah, so let's say, let's say you had like the trip well, the CT scanner at clinic that's running, it's supposed to be running at 5, but at uh, midnight it's it's calling out right. Um, how does that how does that work make it back into organizations for a healthcare technology? Yeah, the application that we installed would do that. Uh, based on what I said earlier, we create the baseline. And we say the baseline is your phone is only supposed to talk to this during these hours. So uh, if it's something abnormal to that, I will get an email. Okay. Yeah. 
and, and it's it's happened. We had our our CTs also start getting pinged by Japan. They threw a flag up for us, and we were like, "What the heck is going on?" So we called up the OEM and said, "We have a problem. Uh, our CTs are being pinged by Japan." And about an hour later, we get a call back from the OEM saying, "Oh, we apologize. We were doing that." We were pinging your devices to check on the health of the system. And my first question was, why are you pinging my devices? <laughs> and what information are you getting off of them? And you need to share that information with me now. So yeah, the, the system works. So it's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah. I think I'm getting towards the end here. Some more future plans. Um, so this is kind of outside of uh, the application now. Different things are we doing in our organization to try to secure our network. Um, I don't know how, if any of you are using LDAP authentication on any of your The only ones that I found right now that are capable of doing that right now is GE. Um, there are also some machines that are, are newer enough to understand the LDAP authentication, which is basically anything that. You know, you, you sign on to your, your laptop with your username and password. It's all that being kidding as a, a server. That's basically all that. <laughs> um, we are finding more and more that that you know, well, two things. Well, it's better for us as an organization. Our end users don't like it. They like just powering up the machine and going out of their business. When you have to pause them to actually log in now, it's an extra step that they want. But they're going to use And it's, it's a mandate, so they can't even think about it. Uh, other things, we USB locks. Uh, we've got these little USB locks that we can put on USB. You know, um, funny thing you find is when you've got the, an, an Apple phone attached to an anesthesia machine. Charger in a, in a surgery suite. Yeah, that's probably not, I wouldn't want to be that patient. But um, so we can lock those down. We got the little keys to them. Um, kind of got slowed on that. Everything was slowed with, with uh, COVID, but uh, we're hoping to get the, that out there again. And then that actually pisses off the service engineers when they come in, the vendors come in and work on our equipment. But what it does actually, in addition to that, is now we know that. You know, Dave from whatever vendor is not sneaking in and working on my equipment because they can't get attached to my USB stick. So now they have to come to the engineers and say, hey, I'm coming in. Can I work on this equipment? And we're trying to change passwords. You know, I'm sure if you want to Google GE passwords or Siemens passwords and got them right off the internet, admin passwords, whatever passwords. So we're trying our best to be able to change those as much as we can. Um, again, with vendor support, um, and we're keeping the admin password, password for the COMS. Our engineers need to know what the admin passwords are, especially when the vendor comes and says, hey, what's the admin password? They know where to get it, they need to call me. I don't keep that. You know, it's a pretty simple process. So, again, creating a process for patching and virus protection, that's always an everyday constant battle. Um, so, Here's just uh, some some issues, some security uh, vulnerabilities. This is again, these slides are from July, so only the first half of the year. But these are some of the things that they've already. Um, well, one other thing I want to talk about real quick um, on our CMS informatics page, we're actually adding an integrate. We, we have added, we're kind of tweaking it, an integration status. So what that means is if, is if I have a device like uh, again, we'll go with radiology also some machine. Well, we know it's integrated with PAX. So we put that in there, integrated with PAX. Is it integrated with your EMR? It, uh, this is a few things that we, we select. EMR, uh, cardio PAX, radio PAX, or radiology PAX. Um, we have a, a, a women's PAX system as well. So we just kind of put it in there so we know what the integration is. So we can kind of just have a desktop. Um, but back to uh, these issues, as you can read, health share of Oregon, 650,000. That was a 
left half got sold. Um, elite emergency uh, positions, 550,000 improper disposal of patient records. So there's the, these vulnerabilities are out there, some of these are, and Rob always says this, our biggest threat is our own people to our, to our vulnerability, to our security. Phishing emails are still a number one killer. Uh, email hack, 232 patients, 1,000 patients. So phishing attacks are still there. Um, and we just had our internal meeting, you know, our internal parliament meeting this, this week, and I reiterated phishing emails and some of the they thought they got one. So we've gotten into the trip. Most organizations have a send to phishing email address that you can send suspicious emails to. Um, just every time you talk to somebody in your organization, you talk about phishing emails, because that's probably going to be the one that takes you down. Not necessarily going to be somebody walking in your door, connecting to a piece of uh, medical device or a piece of equipment of yours attached to tap into your network. It's going to be remote. Just some other examples 200,000 phishing, 170,000 accounting for a by ransomware attack. Um, I get some more examples that are just in the news as of like last week um, University Health Services. Uh, we all read, read about that. They have 400, 400 locations across this country. And um, they were hit with ransomware. And I, I don't know what the status of them now today, but earlier in the week they're they were back on paper. Um, most of the organizations have uh, all your drugs on the on the on the network now. Well, if your network is taken down, or your EMR can talk to the drug, the drug library, the drug dispenser, you're not getting drugs out there easily. So yeah, there's just a lot of different things going on in Dusseldorf, Germany. This one actually um, is suspected of causing a death. Um, this is the first one I've actually heard of causing a death. Uh, what happened there was Hospital A got uh, attacked by ransomware. So they had to de deter or defer a patient to a Hospital B and then transit the patient out. So the, the lack of immediate care for that patient Cause their demise. <clears throat> and our article from Health IT Security, which is a good website, if you guys uh, on that, Healthcare IT Security website is a good one to log into and, and join up with, suggests that 44% of healthcare providers meet NIST cyber, cyber security standards, only 44%. Um, so that's just a security standard. There's, there's a few of them out there. NIST is, is one of the bigger ones. Yes. I don't know if you're going to cover it at all, but I mean, uh, my organization had quite a significant breach um, quite a few years back now. That took two laptops uh, from an administrative area that had education. Nice. Including mine. Um, so we're, we're under OCR watch, and we're, uh, they're very focused on encryption. Right. So talk to us about encryption because that's an obstacle for us, right? In the medical device world, because none of our none of our devices. Well, I don't know if any of our devices, maybe a few Windows 10 that, that are uh, operating uh, with encryption. Sure. Tell me about that. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of question in there. I'll see if I can unpack uh, as mm -hmm. much as I can. So let's start with the medical devices. Um, encryption right now, again. So some of the medical devices that can encrypt the hard drive, and that at least if somebody stole a hard drive, then they, then they need to know the encryption. So that protects the data on that medical device or that particular device. Most, if not all, I'll say most, transmissions of data in between a device and the rest of the network is also transmitted in an encryption, encrypted network. So that again protects that information. Um, devices themselves, if your organization is not encrypted in those hard drives, and that's a failure of your organization, I'll just say it right, look at this one. Yeah, um, because this hard drive in here, you know, if you if you take a hard drive out, again, if it's encrypted, then it's useless to most people. I mean, I get that there's hackers out there that can figure out encryption keys and whatnot, but most most people just want to be able to 
it ends with you lost two laptops and, then, and they're able to get into those laptops. You know, again, if if you boot up a laptop, and I would say probably 99% of a home PC go like this, you turn it on, you're ready. If you do that with a hospital PC, it's, yeah, it was an admin area, and this was you know, before we were, they, those were unencrypted. Okay. So, but I wanted to really That's touch on with you, though, is the whole encryption. That's nice. Yeah. Because I've had to write little statements about you know, FDA and manufacturers not willing to accept encryption on the device because it might impact performance. And I don't have any. And, um, you know, that's for the, the, the risk. If you get past the network, the risk, as you mentioned earlier, for those standalone devices, right. that somebody walks in, you know, it's a busy clinic, they walk in, they can grab the PHI off of it, or, um, or they can walk on the device. So it's, it's where these devices can walk. Right. You know, yeah. Thing, you know, well, it's amazing what you can do if you look confident, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I work in my hospital with PCs and monitors, and in my course, my business, but but never got a question if I got a badge on or not. Never got a question. Uh, other than that, but which guy? My question is device patching. So, how, what's your plan as far as, I see that's kind of easy for me, but um, I mean, is a problem. So, what's your plan for that for technicians to complete that? Right. All right. Okay. I will complete this uh, equation. I'm going to ask you. Um, equation. So, yeah. So, that's, I think the MBS, I mentioned the MBS two form um, earlier. What we're still trying to figure out in our organization is I don't say this. so the procurement process is what it is, right? And so most of the time, and Rob can correct me when I'm wrong, but most of the time when we get to a, a, a point that we're looking at buying something, it's because the doctor's so much in love with it that we can't say no. So now we're the screen on the backside. So now we get to I can, I can pull an MBS2 from the manufacturer, hopefully it's accurate, because I, I have no way to prove that this risk. I gotta go with their word, so I'm gonna say it's accurate. I look through there to see if there's a if, if there's not encryption nowadays, if there's not encryption on the hard drive, at least, then we're we're uh, you know raising our retire, I mean, red flags as high as we wave them as hard as we can. Because you're right, you know, if it's an MRI, obviously it's not gonna walk away. If it's a, a laptop device, which a lot of these now are going to come, um, if they're not encrypted, yeah, then the danger is, is truly there. So it's, it's never, uh, uh, hopefully, all the manufacturers will get on board and at least, again, encrypt their hard drive with the patient data, uh, at least that partition. And that's what we do with the ultrasound machines. Um, if it didn't already come encrypted, then it's got capability to ensure that we do that. Um, and so, yeah, it's a struggle, but we're, we're trying to get It's something we also play as an organization that we know we're, we're not going to be able to 100% secure that, right? We know that we can control the operating platform that the medical device is on. I'm not going to turn off a cath lab just because it's going in Windows NT. I can't. I got to be able to treat patients. So let's secure that as best as possible. Let's do the micro segmentation. Let's, let's make it as close as possible. The same thing is with encryption. We've had those conversations saying, we know we can't encrypt this medical device. So what's, how do we best secure it? Okay, well, let's put, US, let's put USB locks in there so no one can come in and, and, and plug it in and, and walk away with, with information. Let's, let's, let's try to secure it. Let's lock it down. Just a change. So we, we, we flag those and we do the best we can. We know it's not going to be 100%. Even encryption is not 100% because you get a bit of a hack to break encryption, right? So you just make it as difficult as possible to gain that information and you just continue to monitor it. You don't just wash your hands and walk away and say, well, we can't do anything about it. It's one of the reasons why we justified having today's position was we have to continually stay on top of it. Just because we can't do it today doesn't mean six months from now, it can't be done. So as the technology advances, we may be able to do something down the road, right? So we stay on top of it, we manage those devices, we're actively doing 
we just have to be aware of it and identify what those areas of concerns are. Do you have a risk register or anything like that? Not, not with that security, not from a cyber security. Yeah, IT yeah. yeah. But yeah, we, I mean, we've gone as far as, I don't know if it was Alan they mentioned, uh, we bought hundreds of USB locks and you just slide in a lot of ports, right? Mm -hmm. It upset a few people because they want to be able to charge your cell phones and open cell machines. Yeah. All right, so tap into your passing question. So if I remember it, it's more, if you want, the, if the engineers are available to do that, let me just, let me answer it this way and see if it answers and then and I can I'll pick apart anything else. Um, that's, again, as I've said multiple times, that's my biggest headache, trying to get the manufacturers to allow me, to, at least off, well, let me rephrase that. Getting the manufacturer to identify if there's a patch available for the products that I have. So again, we're a relatively small organization, um, but I still have, I think roughly between 140, 150 different manufacturers that are medical devices that are on our network. So that's 140 to 150 different processes that I have to understand and identify, and hopefully, but um, so I go, I, I literally write emails constantly to my sales, to my account managers, to whomever I can find in that organization to say, hey, what can I do for patching for this, for this particular device? And, and it always comes back to the, I'm the, from the vendor that, you know, if I get a response, that um, this is the process we're still working through, our, our fantastic process that we're going to, you know, evolve to, which, you know, could be years away. But if they do have a patch, then the next question is who can do it. Um, we didn't mention, but what we do in Info Healthcare is we do all of our service in house. We don't we don't carry any service that I won't say any very, very minimal if we do it all. Um, so that means that we get you know we've got trained engineers that go to the manufacturer and they get trained on the devices and they get the admin passwords and all that stuff. So then it comes back to from the vendor. Who who has to do that patch? Does it have to be their service engineer, or can it be our engineers? And it, it, that, that's where I'm trying to document all this. And again, it's probably the extension on the on the informatics page again. Say, okay, patching process. Who can do it? Where do we get it? How do I? You know, I need a database for myself just to figure out these 140 different vendors. What what do I have to do to get a patch? Basically, is that. Kind of answer your question. It's that's why it's it's a, it's a never to be process. It's never to be solved. Um, we had a little bit past ten o'clock. We got until ten fifteen. There's other questions. Um, I think I was, I think I was done. Go up your uh, thing. Yeah. 